All right, everybody, let's get the lecture going for this morning. How is everybody doing today? Doing, doing all right? Doing all right, hope everybody had a good week. So the plan for today is we're gonna be thinking about electric fields. Now, over the past couple of weeks of the semester, we've been thinking a lot about electricity, but in the concept of circuits. So we've been thinking about charge, and we've been thinking about current, and we've been thinking about voltage. But these have all been concepts when we're thinking about moving charge around in a circuit. Now, this morning, we're going to generalize some of these ideas and start to think about charge and the forces acting on them on a more fundamental level. So we're going to start by thinking about the force acting on some charges and the amount of work that we need to do to move charges around. And what we're going to be building towards today is an understanding of exactly what we mean when we're talking about the electric field. Now, the story of the electric field, it really starts with this situation over here. And you can really think of this in terms of an experimental setup, so an empirical result that describes what's going on with these charges. So we've got a charge over here, a nice positive charge that I'm calling charge Q1. And that's separated by a distance R from a negative charge over here that we're calling charge Q2. And we can start to build our understanding of what we mean when we're talking about electric fields by thinking about the force that's going on between these two charges. And this really started out just as an experimental result. So if we set some charges and we have them at a distance, what's the force between those two charges? So let's start with a question I've got over here. So we've got this situation that if the distance between our two charges is doubled, then the force between those charges decreases by a factor of four. So out of these options here, which of these options describes this relationship here? If you're not sure about this question, you don't have to guess. You can try just picking a couple of examples of distance, try doubling them, see how that force is gonna vary as you're changing the distance, and then see which of these proportionality relationships is gonna give us that scaling between force and distance that we're after. All right, very good to see those responses coming in here. Let's see what everybody thinks for this question. Which of these describes this proportionality relationship? All right, okay, so nobody's going for option C. People thinking maybe it could be A or B. It looks like most people are going for option D. Now, if we take a look at the options that we have over here. Now, I can see what people might be thinking about with options A and B over here. So, you know, here we've got the force proportional to R squared. So here, if we double our distance, then the force is going to increase by a factor of four. So you're kind of thinking along the right lines, but what this option will give us is a force which increases as our distance increases. Now, I can also see what people are thinking about with this one here, with the square root, because we're thinking, okay, well, maybe we want the opposite of that, so maybe we want the um, square root, but that's not gonna quite give us this proportionality relationship that we're after. So think about what's gonna happen if we, say, make the distance three times larger. We want the force to decrease by a factor of nine. And the correct option, which gives us that scaling relationship there, is option D over here. So very well done, everybody who gave this question a go, especially if you got that the correct option is answer D over here. Now, even though this is just a proportionality relationship, this is a very important kind of relationship in physics. And we're gonna see this over and over again throughout the rest of the semester. And it's actually what we call the inverse square law because the force here, it's 
inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So every, every time we make the distance bigger, the force decreases as the square of the distance. So very, very important kind of relationship. We're going to see lots and lots of examples of this kind of proportionality relationship for the rest of the semester. So this is a great start to putting together the picture of what's going on with that relationship between the force acting on those charges over there. So this describes how the force varies with the distance between the charges. But if we want to build up this picture a bit more, we need to be a bit more exact. We need to be a bit more specific about exactly how this force depends on what the charges are. Now, in this relationship here, we have a proportionality relationship. Now, we can turn a proportionality into an equals relation if we introduce a constant of proportionality. So who's seen constants of proportionality before? So you can just add in a, a k there. OK, OK. So if you haven't seen this before, the idea is that instead of just having that proportional symbol, we just add in some constant fixed value. And that's going to do the same thing for us. So in this next question, let's start and have a think about how can we be a bit more exact with how does our force not only depend on the distance, so r, but also on what the charges are acting on those two particles. So we have a few points to note here. So we can know that the force, it's attractive for opposite charges and it's repulsive for like charges. So if we have two positive charges or two negative charges, they're going to want to be pushed away from each other. And we also know just from a kind of empirical result that the force is directly proportional to each charge. So if we make one of the charges twice as big, then the force is also going to be twice as big. And then the last point here, as we saw in the last question, the force is also inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So we have a few things on the menu of options that we want to include in our force here. So have a look at these options here. See which one of these is going to describe all of these properties for the force acting between these two particles. So again, with this question, if you're not too sure about it, you don't need to guess. We've actually got all of the things that we're looking out for in this question. So we know that the force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. And we also know that the force is directly proportional to each of the charges. So have a look in each of those options. See which one of those relationships between the charge and the distance is going to give us that force that we're looking for. All right, very good to see those responses coming in. Let's see what everybody thinks for this question. What is the exact relationship for the force between these two charges? Let's see what everybody thinks here. OK, so nobody's going for option C. So some people going for options A and D. It looks like most people going for option B. So if we have a look at these different options that we have for the force, um, so some of them they depend on r squared. So we know that they don't depend inversely on r. So it's, we know it's got to be one of option A or B because these both depend inversely on r squared. And we also know that the force is directly proportional to each charge. So if we make, say, either one of the charges 10 times bigger, then we know that the force is also going to be 10 times bigger. So the relationship which describes all of those things in one is this one over here, so option B. So very well done, everybody who gave this question a go, especially if you've got that the correct answer is option B. Now, this is actually a really important result whenever we're thinking about the force between two charges. Has anybody seen this equation before? If you've maybe studied this before, has anybody seen this before? OK, OK. So this result over here is actually what we call Coulomb's law. Um, after one of the pioneers of electricity, 
who was one of the first people to really describe this law as we have it written down here. So if you're following along in your notes, definitely put a big old box around this equation here because it's a very important result that describes the force between two point charges. Now, this K here, we've thought about it, we've approached it just as a constant of proportionality. And that's really how it appears when we're thinking about this as an experiment. And this K is actually what we call now Coulomb's constant. So it's some value that we can measure in the lab. We can see what Coulomb's constant is. And that sets the scale for what this force is, as it depends on what the charges are and the distance. So very important result. Very well done, everybody, for putting those pieces together and seeing what it is. Now that we have an equation for what the force is between our two charges, what this allows us to do is to start to think about how much work we need to do if we're moving these charges around. So that's one of the reasons why it's such an important result. Now, before we jump straight in and start thinking about how much work we're doing with Coulomb's law, I'd like to spend just a couple of slides to recap what's going on with work and forces a bit more general, and specifically seeing how all this happens in the context of Hooke's law. So do you guys remember uh, Hooke's law? Let's just uh, remind ourselves of what's going on here. Do you guys remember this situation here? So what we had, we had some mass on a spring, and what we're thinking about on this graph is the distance, and it's the distance how much we've compressed the spring or how much we've stretched the spring. And on this axis, we have the force, so the force that is going on with the spring. So if you remember from Hooke's law from last semester, we know that that force is equal to minus kx there. So it's going to look something like this. So just a constant line with some negative slope. And now here, the k, different kind of k to Coulomb's constant, it's just the k which describes the, um, how strong the spring is. So it describes the spring constant. But it's the same kind of idea. So it's a constant of proportionality that relates the distance to what the force is. The reason this is a really good example to think about when we're thinking about what's going on with forces is because the relationship between the force and the distance is a bit more straightforward. It's just a line. So this is the setup. Now let's imagine we've got our spring over here and we want to come over and we're going to go and compress the spring. So we're going to be doing some work. We're going to be exerting a force over a distance to compress the spring. Now, work is always force times distance. But what's a bit interesting here is that our force depends on the distance. Now, another way of saying that work is force times a distance, if we have a look at what's going on over here, is that work is the area under this um, line here. Okay? So if we shade in this region over here, that's giving us the force times the distance, which is the work. So this shaded region over here is the amount of work that we've done when we've compressed the spring. So this is a very important principle because it allows us to generalize how much work we've done. So it's all one good saying, okay, work is force times distance. That's just fine if our force is constant. But if our force is changing with distance, then we can use this principle that the work done is the area under this force versus distance curve. That's going to allow us to calculate how much work we've done, whatever the equation for the force is. Do you guys remember last semester we figured out what the area of this triangle is, you know, and it's a triangle, so we can work out the area with geometry, so it's, you know, the, the half kx squared. That's how much work we need to do to compress the spring, or equivalently, how much energy is stored in the spring once we have done that work. 
Now, when our force is Hooke's law and the force equation is a straight line, we can work out this area just with geometry. So as long as we can work out the area of a triangle. So what I'd like to think about next is the exact same picture as this, but instead of the force being Hooke's law, let's see what happens when we switch the force around and we now think about the force being Coulomb's law. So exactly the same picture here, but just switched it around. And we're now thinking about the force between these two charges. So we've got um, the negative charge over there, the positive charge over here, still have distance on this axis and we still have force over here. But what's changed is because instead of we're not thinking about a mass on a spring anymore, we're now thinking about the force between two charges. Now you guys just figured out what the force between those two charges is. It's Coulomb's law, so K Q1 Q2 over R squared. So let's plot that force on this graph see what we get over here. So it starts off very low at large distances. And then as we get closer and closer, as we're getting closer to Q1, the force really increases. So this is what that inverse square force law looks like when we plot it on a graph. Now, if we think about Q2 over there and Q1, we can think about how much work we need to do or is going to be done if we're moving these charges around. So let's suppose we bring Q2 over there, bring Q2 all the way over here to some distance r. Okay. Now we can mark that distance just on the graph here. That's going to help us to think about exactly what's going on. Now, it's exactly the same principle as with that mass on a spring, in that if we want to calculate how much work is done against this force, it's just this area here um, underneath the force versus distance curve. So we can shade it in here. This area under the graph represents the amount of work that we need to do. Now, in this situation here, we've got opposite charges, so they're going to want to be attracted. So this area might represent if we wanted to then bring that Q2 back to that original position over there, this is how much work we would need to do. But it's a bit trickier to figure out exactly what the area is because this force isn't just a straight line in this area, it's not just a triangle. Now, how many of you have done a bit of calculus before, done some integration before? Okay, okay, great. So, if you've done some calculus before, done some integration, you can probably recognize that working out what this area under the curve is, that's exactly what we need uh, calculus, what we need some integration for. Now, if you haven't done any calculus before, that's absolutely fine. We're just going to take a couple of key results and apply them to this situation. What we're doing is just figuring out what this area under the graph is because that's going to tell us how much work is involved in this situation. So in this question here, let's think about all of the pieces of the puzzle that we have and what we get when we put them together to calculate how much work is involved in moving these charges around. Now, this first relationship here, what work is, remember work is always just a force times a distance. The only thing different in this equation here is that we're not necessarily thinking about a constant force. So maybe our force changes with distance. So if our force changes with distance, we can't just multiply that force times a distance. We have to integrate that force over a distance. And that's what this little integral sign over here is telling us. Now, in this specific situation, when we're thinking about the force on two charges, we know that the force is Coulomb's law that you guys just figured out. So the force is KQ1, Q2 over R squared. So we know what the force is. Now, we can work out what that area is by figuring out that integral. So we're integrating this force over distance, and we're going to use this standard integral before. So how many people have seen this standard integral result before? Okay, okay, great. So if you've seen this before, then hopefully this should be kind of fairly familiar. 
If you haven't seen this before or maybe a bit rusty or um, you're not too sure about this, we're really just applying this one result from calculus to this situation. So whenever we're trying to work out the integral of any function, so x to the n, so it could be you know, n equals 3 or you know, any number we like, we can work out what the area under that curve is, what the integral is, with this really neat relationship here. So whatever our n is, we just, our result is just x to the n plus 1, and then we divide the whole thing by that n plus 1 over there. And that's going to tell us what the area under that curve is. So those are the pieces of the puzzle there. And when we work out that integral of the force over distance, that's going to tell us the work involved. Now, just one more point about this. If you have a look at the actual work over here, I've put some absolute values over the work there. So we're not worrying about if the work is positive or negative. We're just thinking about the absolute value of the work. Now, what does this represent physically? Well, what it means is um, maybe if the, um, the force is repulsive, then we're going to have to come and do the work ourselves to push the charges together. We're going to have to do the work. Or if um, the force is repulsive and they're already close to each other, then that force is just going to push them apart. So whenever we're thinking about the work done, there can be some ambiguity whether we're talking about the work that we have to come in and do to move the charges around or the work that is being done on the charges. So in this question, we're not worrying about whether the work is positive or negative, so whether we're doing the work or maybe the work's being done on us. We're just thinking what the absolute value of the work is. So based on that standard integral, based on what that force is, have a think about which of these four options is going to tell us how much work we need to do whenever we're thinking about moving some charges around. If you're not too sure about this one, remember, we're just applying this standard integral result there. So that integral of x to the n is equal to x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. In our particular force that we're integrating, that k, the q1 and the q2, they're just constants, so we don't need to worry too much about them. We're really just thinking about that r squared there. And what the question is really about is, what n does that r squared correspond to? Have a think about that. Have a think about what that n is going to be when we apply that standard integral. And have a look at which of those options we're going to get for the work once we've integrated that force over a distance. All right, very good to see those responses coming in. Let's see what everybody thinks for this one. How much work do we need to do when we are moving our charges around? Okay, so got a kind of range of options here. Some people think in A, kind of evenly split for B and C, but it looks like most people in this question are going for option D. Now, if you went for option D, I can see why uh, you might have gone for that, because if we have a look at this result here, you know, x to the n, it's equal to x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. So if we have n is equal to 2, so then we've got 2 plus 1 is 3, and then we divide by n plus 1, which is 3, that's going to give us this third over here. So if you went for option D, I can see why you might have gone for this one. But remember in our force here, even though that looks like a 2, we're actually dividing by r squared. So that's equivalent to multiplying by r to the minus 2. So if we're thinking about using this standard integral over here, our value for n, it's not 2, it's actually minus 2. So what we really have is r to the minus 2 here. So if we think about what that's going to give us when we apply this standard integral result, so minus 2 add 1 is going to give us minus 1. So what we're looking for here is which one of these works is proportional to r to the minus 1. Now r to the minus 1, that's the same as dividing by r. So if we have a look at the results here, the correct answer is option C. So very well done everybody who gave this question a go, especially if you got that the correct answer 
is option C because it's a bit of a tricky one. Now, you may be wondering if we apply this standard integral and we're dividing by minus one, what happened to that minus sign? Shouldn't we have a minus sign in front of this? But remember, we're thinking about the absolute value of the work involved. So we're not worrying about if the work is positive or negative, we're just thinking about the absolute value of the work. So remember, physically what that represents is we're just thinking about the total amount of energy that we need to move these charges around, and we're not worrying about is this energy maybe coming from outside to push some charges where they don't want to be, or maybe if the charges they want to be moved apart, um, then that energy is coming from the potential energy of where the charges are. We're just thinking about the absolute value of the uh, work involved. Now, if you look up this equation in the textbook or online, you may sometimes see it written with a minus sign there and other times written without a minus sign there. So always think about based on what the sign of the charges are and whether they're going to be attractive or repulsive and whether we're thinking about the work done by the charges or maybe done outside by someone else in moving the charges if the actual value of the work is going to be positive or negative. But whether the work is positive or negative, we always know this is what the absolute value of the work is going to be. So very well done, everybody, with this question. Now, for the last few slides for today, let's return to this original picture that we started with, with the positive charge and the negative charge over here. Because now that we know a bit about the forces involved between these two charges, and also the work done when we're moving these charges around, we can start to describe some very useful, it's really beautiful geometric properties to describe what's going on with the force between these two charges. Now, one of the first most important things that we can use to describe what's going on with these charges is to draw on what we call electric field lines. And what these are is these are lines that we can draw around the charges. And if you look, that all the lines have arrows on them. And what these field lines tell us is the path that a positive test charge would take if we put it somewhere and we let it go. So if we take an imaginary positive test charge and we put it over here next to this positive test charge, well, they're like charges, they're going to be repelled. So our positive test charge is going to move from here, going to want to very quickly move over to this negative test charge over here. And if we put our positive test charge and we put it over here, it's still going to be repelled from this other positive test charge, going to be moved away, and eventually it's going to come and circle back around and end up with the negative charge over there. So if you're not sure about what's going on with an electric field line, always imagine a little positive test charge. Imagine the path that it's going to take, OK? And the path that it traces out is going to be the electric field lines. And the direction of the electric field lines, it's always that direction. So away from positive test charges and towards negative charges. So electric field lines tell us the path of a positive test charge. So what would happen to a positive test charge if we put it in the situation and just let it go? Now, wherever we put that positive test charge, it's always going to be feeling the force of these other charges. So if that test charge is moving around there, it's covering some distance, it's exerting a force over a distance, we're going to need to be doing some work. So whenever we're moving charges along these electric field lines, work is going to be involved. We're going to need some energy to do that. Now, if we want to move a charge around here, but without using any energy, there are paths that we can take. And these are all paths which are going to keep our energy the same. And we can actually draw these on here. So all of these paths here are what we call equipotential lines. Now, if you've ever done a bit of hiking up mountains or anything this, like this, or climbing over hills, and you've seen these topographic lines in hills, it's kind of the same idea with this, because with a hill, a topographic line shows you a line that you can walk without changing your elevation. So you're not changing your gravitational potential energy. And it's really the same kind of idea with these 
equipotential lines over here. So if we follow any one of these lines around here, we're always keeping the same distance from the charge. And we don't need to do any work to move a charge around on these equipotential lines. So they show us lines of constant potential energy. So that work that we just calculated, that's not going to change as long as we stick to these equipotential lines. And another really beautiful geometrical property, if you notice that the equipotential lines, they always intersect the electric field lines at right angles. So whenever we see an electric field line intersecting with an equipotential line, there's always a right angle going on there. So if you're thinking about sketching some equipotential lines, step one is actually to draw the electric field lines, so the path that the positive charge is going to take, and then just find some right angles there and connect all of those right angles, and that's going to give you the equipotential lines. So these are two very important kinds of lines when we're thinking about describing what's going on with some charges. We've got the electric field lines, and we've got the equipotential lines. Now we know how to describe electric field lines and how they're related to equipotential lines. We're ready to think about exactly how to describe what the electric field is. So in this last question for today, let's think a bit quantitatively, a bit more mathematically, about exactly how we define the electric field. So if we have some charge and it's sitting in an electric field, we know that the force that that charge is going to experience is equal to the charge multiplied by the electric field. So based on this definition here, let's think, what's the electric field going to be due to a point charge? Now, whenever we have a point charge, we know that the force that's going to be given by Coulomb's law. So if that force is given by Coulomb's law, based on this description of the electric field, which of these relationships is going to describe the electric field due to that charge there? With this question, remember that the force is given by KQQ over R squared. That's what the force is. And we know the electric field is essentially going to be the force divided by one of those charges there. So have a look at those options there. Which one is going to describe an electric field where it's that force with one of the charges divided out? All right, very good to see those responses coming in. Let's see what everybody thinks for this question. Which of these options is the electric field due to a point charge? Let's have a look here. Okay, so we've got a kind of range of options here. Some people think it would be A, B, C or D here. But maybe if we start with option A over here, so option A, KQQ over R squared. So remember, this might look familiar, but this is actually what we get for the force between two charges. So if we have two charges, Q, big Q and little Q, separated by distance R, this option A here is the force between them. So I can see where you might be thinking with that one if it looked familiar, but remember, so the electric field is defined in terms of this relation here. So if we take the electric field, multiply it by a charge, that gives us the force. So if we rearrange this solve for the electric field, we get that the electric field is the force divided by the charge. So if we start from the force and we divide out that little charge there, what that actually gives us is option B over here. So very well done everybody who gave that question a go, especially if you got that the correct answer is option B. Now, this is another very important result because it tells us the electric field due to a point charge. So if we have a point charge, so a big lump of charge that we call Q, what this equation tells us is how strong the electric field is if we are a distance R from the charge. So very important results. So very well done everybody for figuring this out, putting the pieces of the puzzle together. But what's interesting about this result over here 
is that it only describes the electric field for a perfectly spherically symmetric point charge. Now, in some situations, that's absolutely fine. But very often in physics, we want to be thinking about more interesting distributions of charges. So uh, for most of this semester, you know, we've been thinking a lot about capacitors. If we want to describe the physics of what's going on in a capacitor, we need to describe the electric field where it's not just due to a point charge. And that's actually what we're going to be thinking about next lecture. So there's a beautiful uh, theorem that allows us to generalize this result called Gauss's law. So we can think about the electric field due to any kind of distribution of charges that we like. So that's the plan for next week, what we're going to be thinking about. But for today, thinking about the electric field due to point charges and between two charges, I think that's a great place to wrap things up for today. So very well done, everybody, with all of the questions. Um, do think about giving the uh, challenge question a go this week, another really um, interesting one to work on. But um, for now, I think that's a great place to wrap things up. So I hope everybody has a great weekend and I'll see you guys all next week. So I'll see you then.